first of all, welcome to everyone. That's welcome to everyone in person and welcome to everyone who is with us virtually. Um, thank you all for attending today's Environmental Ethics Seminar, uh, which is a part of the Environmental Ethics Seminar series that is held every semester here at UGA since 1983 when the Environmental Ethics Program was started. Um, it was the first uh, inter interdisciplinary environmental ethics program in the country, and we're um, proud and honored to carry on the, uh, the, the legacy that uh, was established here back in the early 80s by folks like Eugene Odom, and as a matter of fact, Daryl Morrison, who came here at the UGA in 1983. This is awesome. questions. I'll probably refer to the in-person audience first for questions, and then, and then if there's questions uh, online, we'll try to monitor that through the, the chat. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce Daryl Morrison. Daryl obviously is a landscape architecture superstar. Uh, throughout his career, he has educated and inspired, I would say, at least three generations of, of students uh, <laughs> to observe and appreciate the beauty and function of natural ecosystems. He's taught at the University of Wisconsin, he taught here at UGA, and also where he served as a dean for 10 years. Um, he's taught at the Conway School of Design and a handful of other visiting lecture positions um, around the country and internationally. Uh, he's earned numerous awards for his teaching, including recognition from the University of Wisconsin, the Chicago Horticultural Society, the American Horticultural Society, and the Council of Educators in Landscape Architecture. His professional designs have been acclaimed also, um, as well as our inspiring um, places. Uh, and they include public landscapes like the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, the New York Botanical Garden, Stolen King Art Center, and numerous private residences. Recently, Daryl's work has been featured in the New York Times, where they refer to Daryl as the elder statesman of the ecological <laughs> landscape in the as well as in the Washington Post. And Daryl's new book, Beauty of the Wild, which captures his experience with the diverse landscapes that that are in his work, but also that you'll hear about today, um, uh, has just been released by the Landscape of American Land Library of American Landscape History. So that, it's an honor to welcome Daryl back to Athens and back to UGA this afternoon. So thank you for being here. Are you ready to go? I'll do you. Great. Well, good to see all of you. There are a number of familiar faces there, I think. <laughs> But it is great that you're here, and I really do appreciate all of your coming. Uh, and I have new students here today. We were on a field trip this morning to Rock and Shoals Granite Outcrop, which was a great morning for me. I hope it was okay for you too. <laughs> and so I'll be talking with I'll be talking to all of you, of course, but maybe especially to the students in the crowd. Uh, former students in the crowd may remember some of the things, but I hope I have added a little bit over the decades since I was your teacher here. Uh, but yeah, Alfie's right, I came here in 1983, was here for 22 years, and uh, now I'm back. <laughs> I live in Madison, Wisconsin now, uh, great, another great city. And today I'm gonna give you a few thoughts about relationship between uh, ecology and, and design, art and science, so to speak, and uh, it's been quite a ride. <laughs> Well, let me get started. Well, I'm gonna start off with four goals that I always have in designing landscapes. And this is a naturally evolving landscape, actually in Madison, Wisconsin. But I'm gonna have this up here while I talk about the four, four goals that I see in landscape design and the, uh, what I strive for in designs, and I, I'm sure many of you do as well but I think it should have four characteristics. It should be ecologically sound, experientially rich, should be of the place, we should know where we are, when we are in a landscape, and it should be dynamic. It should be changing over time, just as naturally evolving landscapes change over time. Let me go into those just a little bit more. <clears throat> First, in terms of being ecologically sound, uh, obviously an ecologically sound landscape is one that doesn't unnecessarily use resources, maybe irrigation water, for example. Uh, one that does not introduce invasive species into the, into the landscape, diminishing diversity on the site or beyond the site. Uh, 
to be matching plants with microenvironments uh, and all of these things that you learn through ecology. Uh, then in terms of being experientially rich, there's no conflict at all in my mind between being in ecologically sound and being experientially rich. I mean, look at this slide on the screen. Uh, this is an ecologically sound landscape and it's a beautiful landscape. The experience of it is, is wonderful. Uh, and in terms of experiencing landscapes, I was influenced early on by the environmental psychologists, Steve and Rachel Kaplan at the University of Michigan, who wrote a book in called, Exper called uh, Experiencing Nature or Nature of Experience. Experience of Nature, there we go, boggled. Uh, and uh, they talk about characteristics of naturally evolving landscapes that I think are very good goals in designed ones too in terms of the experiential aspect. First, they should be, there should be mystery we shouldn't see everything at once. There should be new things to discover. We can do that through the spatial design. We can do it uh, in a number of through a number of devices. In addition to being <clears throat> having mystery, should be, there should be complexity. There needs to be detail, and needs to, as we have in the, uh, the slide on the screen, lots of detail. Uh, unlike quite a few design landscapes that are trees set in lawn period. Uh, there's so much more, so, many, so much more possibility. Uh, so experientially, we, we think of having mystery, complexity, and then the third characteristic is coherence. In nature, we see plants grouped, they're aggregated to various degrees, and in the slide on the screen, you see zones that are dominated by one species, and then that grades into another zone, which is dominated by other species, and so we have, we ha we have that um, complexity, but we, with coherence. The pattern gives it coherence. And you're gonna hear me talk more about patterns and maybe especially about a pattern I call the drift, where there's a, a group of plants that form a, a drift in the landscape. Uh, a high level of aggregation, maybe in a central area, and then they trail off in one direction or another. Uh, and then in addition, they should be of the place. Um, Gertrude Stein made a comment once about her, her one-time hometown of Oakland, California, in which she said, there is no there there. We gotta bring the there there or the here here. <laughs> we need to know where we are when we're in a landscape. And certainly one way of doing it is using the, the, the vegetation that is native to a region in that region when we're doing design work. Uh, the fourth characteristic is that the landscape be dynamic that it change over time. I like to think that landscape design is, is four-dimensional design. Uh, in, we think of paintings as being two-dimensional art, sculpture and architecture is three-dimensional art, but landscape is four-dimensional with change as the, with time as the fourth dimension. Uh, and we certainly would see that in the landscape that's on the screen now. And we'll talk more about that as we, as we go along and look at both naturally evolving and designed landscapes. An important point in my life is when I was introduced to a book called American Plants for American Gardens, which was co-authored by an ecologist, Edith Roberts, and a, a, a landscape architect, Elsa Raymond. Uh, again, the book is called American Plants for American Gardens. And I first learned about this from, from my boss at the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, my first real job as a landscape architect. And one of his teachers had been um, at Penn State, John, John Bracken, and he'd introduced this book to my boss, Joe Condis. And Joe Condis loaned me the book, American Plants for American Gardens, and I was really taken by it. Uh, it just made so much sense. The two authors talked about the plant communities of Dutchess County, New York, with plant lists of plants that grow together in a particular environment. And, and uh, they talked about how logical, and I think how logical it is to work with plant communities. I remember I used to talk to some of you about how, what a, what a discordant element a blue spruce is in a, uh, 
in a deciduous forest or adjacent to a deciduous forest. The Colorado blue spruce is great in Colorado, but probably not in Illinois or Iowa or Georgia. Uh, and so um, that compatibility of, of uh, species in the community where they belong. Something else this slide reminds me of is a, a, a paper I read written by the landscape architect A.E. Bye, B-Y-E, back in 1967. I remember it well. <laughs> and the name of the, the article was Landscape Luminosity. And he talked about the possibility of capturing light on translucent vegetation. Here we have cinnamon ferns uh, with backlighting. And this really does illuminate the landscape. Uh, and, and you can do that in design. You can strategically place something so that it will capture the backlighting during a, a certain part of the day and get experiences like this. I have to also mention, since we have cinnamon fern on here, <clears throat> one of my graduate students here was Connie Gray, who's in the audience. And uh, she wrote a thesis on, on ferns. And uh, the title of her thesis was, With Fronds Like These. <laughs> and so I, for years since then, I, in the field, when I come across a cinnamon fern or a beautiful fern, the students hear the same old story. With fronds like these, who needs anemone? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> one of many bad puns that I really enjoy. <laughs> the, <clears throat> another one, well, I'll save it. <laughs> All right. so. Mystery, complexity, coherence, and legibility. Legibility, we didn't talk about, did we? Legibility is being able to see how you move through a landscape uh, and, and uh, not feel entrapped or, or, or uh, disoriented. And maybe especially when we think about designing healing gardens, we need legible landscapes that people can find their way. Uh, there can still be a degree of mystery but not, not uh, chaotic mystery. Okay, now here's a class in a granite outcrop. Some of you may be in this picture, I don't know. This is a class of 2000, I think, they graduated in 2000. Uh, anyway, this group is on, they were in my, my, my class called the Garden Design Studio. And you look at this and you say, garden design? Yes, <laughs> there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from granite outcrops. As the class this morning uh, that I was with observed. Uh, but anyway, here we are on Heggie's Rock, a preserved 100 acre natural area uh, near, near Augusta that we went to, various classes went to many times. And the, the next slide, I think, will show us something about garden design. There. Okay, this is at Heggie's Rock. And those of you who were with me this morning saw something somewhat similar to this at uh, Rock and Shoals area off Barnett Shoals Road in, in uh, Athens. But <clears throat> the design part in this is that it does show those characteristics that the, the Kaplan's identified, uh, mystery, complexity, coherence, and legibility. And the mystery comes from the fact that there are areas of red cedars and other vegetation that blocks the, the view, creating room-like spaces. Uh, and so we, 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 have, uh, we don't see what, what's in the distance because of the, the cedars. So we have that element of mystery. And we have complexity, certainly, in the, the different uh, species present. Foreground, we have lichens and mosses. And then we have the uh, yuccas, yucca filamentosa in the, the midsection where the soils may be slightly deeper. And where it's a little bit deeper, we have broom sedge and, and little blue stem probably. And then where it's a little bit deeper yet, we have various shrubs and red cedars and oak species growing. So there's, there's that, there's a lot of species diversity. But it holds together, there is the coherence element because the plants are aggregated based on the micro environment that they're growing in. And uh, here especially, I think the yucca demonstrates that quality that I called the drift, where we have a heavy uh, aggregation of, of yucca, and then they trail off in each direction, and other species pick up as the environment changes, as the soil gets deeper uh, or more shallow, whichever direction it might be. So there is uh, 
There's complexity, but there's also coherence. There's pattern, perceptible pattern. And in terms of legibility, here I think the legibility comes from the, the plants giving us a, an indication of where, where we are. Again, the lichens and mosses tell us we're in very shallow soil. The yucca may be deeper soil and so on. So there's that sort of legibility, but also one can feel how you might move through this. And, uh, and that's an, another strength from the, the Kaplan standpoint. Okay. Now somebody who um, <clears throat> I think in his work captured much of the, many of those qualities. This is in Columbus Park in Chicago, a landscape designed by Jens Jensen, Danish born landscape architect, uh, who worked in the Chicago parks from about 1888 until the 1920s. Uh, and here we see first mystery because we, we have the peninsula of trees coming in from the right and we don't know exactly what's back there. So there's more to discover if we go around the peninsula. There's mystery, but there's complexity. There's a variety of species, wet, wet tolerant species near the, the lagoon that was, was dredged and he called it the Prairie River. So there's that complexity, uh, but yet there's, there's um, continuity, uh, coherence uh, because of the grouping of the plants. Uh, and finally, there's legibility because we can see how we can move through it. And Jens, Jensen was certainly one of my, my design heroes. And I think some of my own work draws on, on what he taught me. Oop. Down arrow, not... <laughs> well, back in about 1973, when I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin, I started a, a native plant community course and then a native plant community field course. And I co-taught it for about 10 years with, a, with an ecologist, Dr. Evelyn Howell at the University of, of Wisconsin. And without going into great detail, I'll mention that this is a, an oak hickory forest, a very good representation of an oak hickory forest. And in, in, in ecological terms, it's a dry mesic forest it's one that, that is moderately dry and often on south and west facing slopes in Wisconsin. And in contrast with, with the uh, oak hickory forest, <laughs> sorry, sorry, we have the maple basswood forest, uh, often occurring on north and northeast facing slopes, which are cooler and, and more adapted to these mesic uh, uh, shade loving, loving species dominated by sugar maple with, with American lindens, ironwood, and, and several other species. But it's not just a case of a woods being a woods, they're all different and they reflect the, the micro environment in which they're, they're growing. Uh, in the oak hickory forest, we saw all the angular branching and, and uh, complexity. In here we have the strong verticals of sugar maples and, and linden, basswoods, et cetera. And then totally different uh, microenvironment about a mile away from the previous slide. This is a steep south facing slope, which has probably experienced burns in the past. And this is a, a, a limestone prairie slope, a very totally different complex. And again, if we start to think in terms of plant communities, we think of plants that grow together in a particular, ha particular habitat. And in the design situation, you, you have a group of plants that are logical for many different, different uh, places. And that gives you your own little mental catalog uh, that is, is really ingrained once you have experienced that landscape. And a lot of you know how, how important I think that field studies are. And many of you have experienced them. And they are important, certainly in terms of inspiration and information on the landscape, but they are also a whole lot of fun as some of you may remember. <laughs> uh, again, patterning in the landscape. This is a, a much more moist prairie than the previous one, but again, this is a prairie in the Midwest. This is at uh, Chewaukee Prairie, very close to Lake Michigan, halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee, hence the name Chewaukee. But just look at the beautiful patterning there. And you can do that in design by your seed mixes and how you distribute them. 
And here's a group in, I believe, 1977 at Chewaukee Prairie, uh, looking closely at the landscape. And in these classes, we would look at square meters. We would identify everything in a square meter and even sometimes map the square meters. And we would find 9, 10, 11 species in one square meter in, in this prairie, for example. Much more complex than so many of our design landscapes. Uh, something else you see is the patterning again. On the ridge, slight ridges, there are shooting stars and, and uh, uh, blue-eyed grass. In the slightly more moist areas, there are sedges and rushes. And you get these, the bands of different colors. And again, you can do that in, in design by matching species with habitat. Here's another site I have to put in. This is a, a prairie in Wisconsin, Avoca Prairie, on a very mosquito-y day. As you notice, everybody's scratching or slapping at mosquitoes. <laughs> but experiencing the whole, the real landscape so much better than reading book, just reading books and, and just uh, looking at, at pictures. We can never totally replicate it. We can get the essence of it and the spirit of it, I think, in our designs. And I always kind of like this picture. I like fog. I'm frequently in a fog. Anyway. Uh, and here we have Maximilian sunflowers and northern prairie cordgrass with the beautiful arching leaves in a, a moist area of, of, of Oka Prairie. And the fog is always great. A very different environment a few miles away is a sand prairie, uh, lupins uh, uh, and pacoons on, on very sandy soil. And even here there's aggregation and patterning in a small scale. Now we're moving closer to Georgia. This, in fact, this slide is taken, was taken in Georgia, probably about 1980 something. Uh, this is Northwest Georgia, uh, a prairie landscape, literally in, in Northwest Georgia, not far from Chattanooga. And I like to ask people to squint a little bit and look at this picture with squinted eyes. And if you do, you see a flowing river, a golden color, and maybe the soil is a little more shallow in that area, or, or there's a bit more or less moisture than adjacent. But anyway, just look at the beautiful patterns. <clears throat> I would like to say I designed that, but I didn't. I just took the picture. <laughs> OK, now bringing this back home to uh, reality. If you're in a design situation, how do you emulate the, the spirit of, of a landscape like the one we just saw? And I like to do it with directional drifts of different species. Here we see a drawing I did for a place in Westchester County, New York. Uh, quarter inch equals a foot was the scale. And each plant represents, uh, uh, is about a quarter of an inch at that scale. So the plants are basically a foot apart or a little more. And uh, here we have a, a, a space that is on the north side of a three-story house. So in the area just at the bottom of the screen, we have a very shaded zone, and there will be certain species there like Christmas fern and blue cohosh, uh, and each different species rep represented by a different symbol. But I tried in this, and I often try in the, this sort of design, to carry the species across the walk. And here, the, the coral colored dots are columbine, which is tolerant of shade on the, close to the house, but it will also grow into uh, out into the sun almost, so it's one that carries through this whole area. Another group of columbine does that here. Um, but the blue cohosh is restricted to the area down here, as is the Christmas fern with fronds like that. Uh, and, and I don't have these cross perpendicularly across the pathway, but I have them moving diagonally, which to me sort of represents, even though it's not truly the case, but it's kind of like the wind distribution of, of species on a site like this. And I will once again show you the picture of this on the ground. There it is, uh, about four years after planting. And you see the wild geraniums here. They jump over to here. Uh, the foam flower is here, and it reoccurs over here. So you see the connections like that, but only to the extent that they match up with the amount of light in that part of the, 
the site. And continuing with drifts, this is a project that I did at New York Botanical Garden in about 2010 on a steeply sloping site with the Bronx River at the bottom of the plan and, uh, and then a, a steep slope uh, above that. And <clears throat> here, the directional drifting was not just herbaceous plants, but included early successional trees. This is a drift of gray birch, which is a pioneer species in an open setting in the Northeast. And we have a drift running this way, another drift running through here with a space through here. And this gets back to the issue of mass space design. And I always told my students, many of you, first thing you gotta get is the mass space design before you get into detailed plant selection and placement, uh, because that becomes the framework for everything that happens after that. And so here we had the, the north, uh, the diagonal groupings of, of uh, gray birch, the pinkish color there is little blue stem, native grass in that region. Then on the left, we have rivers of ferns and, and uh, woodland plants coming in from the left. And I won't go into the detail of the, the species, but uh, the, the lists at the bottom of the page represent the number of plants of certain species in each of the drifts. Uh, and we, we had, I guess, 40 species in this, which is not extremely species rich, but uh, gives you a lot of, a lot of uh, diversity. I'll mention one other thing about this. Um, I was, when I did this, I was working under the direction of Gregory Long, who was the director of the New York Botanical Garden, and he really wanted a row of flowering dogwoods along the top of the slope. And I didn't really want to put them in but he was Gregory Long, the director of New York Botanical Garden, and I didn't quibble, I put him in. But anyway, when we were planting this, we planted about 10,000 plants, uh, uh, herbaceous plants, 200 trees and shrubs, on a very, during a very hot summer, 2010. Uh, anyway, we, we, were, we hadn't planted the dogwoods yet, and Gregory and one of his vice presidents came through, and I had him stand up here somewhere, and I said, I'm afraid if we put in those dogwoods, we will block the view down to the Bronx River or of the bridge over here. And he looked at it and he said, you're right. We don't need those dogwoods there. So we found other homes for them on the site. And uh, that was, was a good move. Uh, next slide is, I believe, just uh, a year later, basically, <laughs> a year later. Um, and here on the, you see the groups of Gray birches coming down here, coming down here, then the river of little blue stem coming down here, a river of various ferns coming in here, um, and then uh, riverside shrubs like buttonbush down here, and uh, verticillata holly. The sharp edge disappeared over time and the plants draped down over it. Uh, but this was pretty exciting. The, but it's always changing, and the, the river of little blue stem now has been pretty much uh, overcome by, by the adjacent growth of woody things, but that's okay. I don't mind the fact that it's evolving and that it will be a different landscape 10 years from now than it is now. And that's something I really think is important, again, that it be dynamic and that we're not dealing with a frozen landscape, frozen, unchanging landscape, but one which will evolve and, and be a different landscape uh, when we see it in the future. Here's a view of the bridge, which would have been blocked by one of the dogwoods. Uh, and uh, I love this, such a beautiful bridge. Anyway, you see the drifts of the river birch going down on each side, and then a, part of the river of little blue stem in the center. And if you look carefully, somewhere in here, you see some little orange flecks that's butterfly weed. And uh, we planted this on, a, I think, a, a June day. And the, the, the plants were started plants and some of the butterfly weeds were blooming a bit. Within an hour, butterflies were coming into this landscape. And they hadn't had reason to for a long time. And that, that certainly is another reason for plant diversity in our plantings. And maybe especially thinking of other creatures that benefit from that. 
in addition to us. And we benefit from the presence of the other creatures as well. And this is uh, from a second floor of the old stone mill, which was adjacent to this, looking down on a very abundant drift of uh, flocks de vericata, woods flocks. And I am quick to point out the drift here. In the lower right hand, we have pretty high density of, of uh, woods flocks. There are other species interspersed with them. But as we go off to the left, uh, the, the flocks become less abundant. They trail off, so we get the real feel of a drift. And then in the background, there's ragwort near the, near the water's edge, near the river's edge. Again, it's forming a drift that tra trails off as we go to the left in the picture. These are two of the dogwoods that we didn't put up by the, the driveway and put into the landscape here. Now for something completely different. Uh, since about mm, 2006, no, 1996, I've been working with Storm King Art Center, Sculpture Park, about an hour and a quarter north of New York City. And I'm gonna be quick to point out that there are grasslands in New York. Long Island uh, had 40,000 acres of prairie, tall grass prairie, basically before it was subdivided and paved over. Uh, now there are 38 remaining acres of prairie on Long Island. But all the more reason to reintroduce those species into eastern landscapes where they, where, where they are logical. And this, again, is at Storm King, where we, a 500-acre sculpture park, and we've converted, I think, about 50 acres of that to tall grass plantings, big, big areas. So we're not just doing decorative planting. We're really trying to make the landscape as a whole sculptural. So we have a sculpture garden with a sculptural landscape, I like to think. And in here, we, we see many of the species that grow in Midwestern prairies and some of which grow in Southern openings as well. Little blue stem, Indian grass, big blue stem, side oats, grandma grass, and so forth. And uh, I'm gonna ask somebody who was on the field trip this morning, what type of plant was moving in our very slight breeze today? Yeah. Grasses, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right answer. <laughs> and that's one thing I love about grasses uh, is that with the slightest bit of breeze, they move, they add life and movement to, to the landscape. And then certainly there's a bit of luminosity here, A.E. Bai's term, where some of the grasses are backlit so they glow. Uh, and again, these are things you can do in design. You can, you can introduce things that will move, that will blow in the breeze and, uh, and catch the light as well. Here's the Suro sculpture with uh, grass planting in the foreground. And uh, design like that doesn't just take care of itself, uh, requires some management. And as some of you would know already, uh, one of the best management tools you have working with native grasses and, and uh, similar landscapes is fire. And here I'm the honorary fire starter <laughs> as Storm King, the year of uh, the fire of 2015. Uh, and it is so effective because it, it obviously burns off the standing dead material from the preceding year. It darkens the soil, it becomes uh, blackened by the, uh, uh, the burn, which means it warms up more quickly. And most of the grass species that we would use in a, in a native grass planting are warm season plants that love the soil temperature above 65 degrees. So if it warms up more quickly, they get a, uh, a jump on things. And it's a great way to suppress cool season, unwanted species, uh, um, introduced species in many cases, because you can, those cool season plants start growing before you light the fire, then you light the fire and it, it suppresses those cool season things and encourages the warm season ones. Uh, just a, a neat device and the Native American population knew this and they, they worked with it uh, a lot. And the fire grows a bit. These pictures were taken by my associate at Columbia University, Diana Drake. And it gets even more exciting. 
And then, <laughs> wow, <laughs> I shouldn't chuckle so much, but anyway, <laughs> it, is, it is quite a spectacle and totally manageable. As you see, we have lawn in the foreground. This fire doesn't inch into the green lawn. It just burns the, the switchgrass and the Indian grass, the dry uh, vegetation from the previous year. And uh, this is, again, just a great management tool. And again, a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about another garden that is pretty close to my heart. This is the extension of the native flora garden at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden in New York in Brooklyn, New York. And just over the horizon where you see the, the grasses in the background, there's a bit of a depression on the other side of, on the other side of the grasses, there's uh, Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. And this is the landscape 100 feet away, which to me is kind of exciting. Here we started with a site that was basically mowed lawn and a few isolated specimen shrubs and trees. And uh, we did a, a redo in uh, the form of a, of a uh, pine barrens grassland. And so all the species you see in the foreground here grow in the New Jersey and Long Island pine barrens. And we put together a composition where there are drifts. Here we see butterfly weed in the lower part of the picture where there is a loose aggregation or a drift uh, and uh, other, other species doing the same thing. And this is, I believe, two years after planting here we planted 15,000 uh, herbaceous plugs, all grown by the Greenbelt Nursery in, on Long Island from seed collected within 50 miles of, of the site uh, from natural, re remaining natural areas like the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Uh, so it, it's truly native species and native propagules of those species. And it just gives me a thrill to know that this is on Flatbush Avenue Carmen, you know all about Flatbush Avenue, right? <laughs> Carmen Fischetti. <laughs> and here's an abstraction of the plant community designations. And as I told you, working with plant communities rather than just individual native plant species is to me just the logical way to go. And but it does require understanding the micro differences on the site we start in the upper right-hand corner here with the driest part of the site, uh, and then it, it grades to a lower spot. And then we, to get the open water for the, the Pine Barrens bog and, and pond, we excavated so that we even multiplied the um, change in, in uh, moisture and, and environment. But we go from xeric meadow, dry mesic, which is intermediate, and then mesic, uh, and then we have a boardwalk, that uh, crosses over the, the pond. And in the lower right, we have a representation of an oak savanna. And there was an existing English oak, the, the big circle here, Quercus rober, growing on the site, about a 30 inch diameter. And I couldn't bring myself to remove it just because it was not <laughs> a burr oak. So in my mind, I converted it to a burr oak, and it looks a lot like a burr oak. <laughs> and then we have Pine Barrens Upland, and we did add a lot of sand here to make it more like the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, uh, and had a bit of a ridge, sandy ridge coming down here, and then graded down to pretty much open water here. Some, I'll mention also, initially I wanted this area to be Pine Barrens too, but there was a little budget problem in doing that amount of planting. So this became, continued to be lawn, and this is all Pine Barrens rich vegetation. Uh, and I, I wasn't thrilled with that, but it does provide a great teaching opportunity. And I've had groups, for example, standing here and they look in this direction, they see all the life. They see the, the grasses and the movements and the butterflies and the, the uh, bumblebees, etc. And uh, then they look this way and they see lawn, no life, no butterflies, no bumblebees, <laughs> and uh, no, no birds. And I was, one time I was in here uh, doing a little volunteer weeding somewhere around here. Father and son appeared here at this walkway 
And he, the little boy got to about this point. He said, look, Daddy, a cactus. And I had prickly pear cactus in the sandy soil here. And that really gave me a thrill, too, to see that Brooklyn kid seeing prickly pear cactus growing in, in, in a garden. Uh, we'll see that in a minute or two, I think. Just a quick note. We often don't see the process drawings, the drawings that lead up to the design. So I do like to put some in occasionally. This is kind of the early scroll, early scratching around that I do. And something I have taken to doing, and some of you have done this in my classes, is to design with music as an inspiration. Turn on some fluid music, some flowing music, and then just let your hands go with it and uh, come up with, with uh, forms that you might not have come up with without that stimulus. And here we're getting into the nitty gritty where I'm showing individual pl placement of plants. And I won't, again, go into great detail, but if you look at certain symbols, you see drifts like here, here's a drift, here's a drift, etc. Uh, and then along the water's edge, there's more of a linear drift. Uh, but it, it just works uh, if, you, if you think in those terms. And this is really getting into the, not into the weeds, but into the native plants. Uh, here, I, this is an abstraction of where the herbaceous plants that we planted as, as uh, plugs would go in. And this is mainly to guide the, the uh, planting crew to deliver the plants to the various parts of the site. And in this case, I was much younger then, I actually placed most of, most of the plants. I started out by actually setting the plant where I wanted it planted. And after a day or two of that, I had to change my ways. And I just used a meter stick and I pointed to where <laughs> the location of each plant would go. Uh, but again, it, it, complexity and diversity is so important. In, in our design landscapes, and it gets neglected too often. Here we see the pine barrens right after planting, the first, first growing season, and you see a lot of exposed sand. A lot of that has disappeared now, and the pines have become much bigger. I'm hoping to see this garden in about three weeks uh, on a trip to Brooklyn. But uh, again, this is certainly not a reproduction of a pine barrens, but it in many ways captures the essence of it. We talked a bit about that this morning in the field, how we, we can't really copy nature successfully, but we can pick the key species and the, the key uh, characteristics, in this case, some bare sand, uh, to create the, the feeling of a particular naturally evolving landscape. Another view here, and there's prickly pear right in the middle of this, this scene with young pitch pines, which have grown quite a lot now. Uh, uh, purple love grass, I believe, in the lower middle. Aragrosta spectabilis. Lo I love that name, spectabilis. <laughs> and here's a, uh, the boardwalk. This was... Um, the detailed design was done by a firm in New York called uh, SiteWorks, and they did a great job with it. And here we have our, our, uh, our Pine Barrens Pond and Pine Barrens uh, herbaceous vegetation. And here's some seeding we did. We planted uh, plugs, but we also seeded certain areas. And here in the center we have uh, Oat grass, Danthonia spicata, which grows in Georgia. Uh, and we grew this from seed in one growing season. This is a year after we, we seeded it. Uh, and I see some bottle brush grass again. And we purposely drifted our seeding, and that's what we got. You can see a, a street light on Flatbush Avenue back there. <laughs> in Jens Jensen's tradition, I incorporated a council ring a small diameter circle here, and it's pretty much enmeshed in mountain mint and goldenrod and various grasses, but it's a great place to sit and, and uh, watch all the life around you. Uh, butterflies, bumblebees, birds. And we talked this morning in the field about the uh, 
relationship of open space to enclosure and how there are certain ratios that may be more effective in terms of people feeling comfortable. And one figure that I have heard and we talked about this morning a little bit is the space should be two and a half times as broad as the enclosure is tall. And that's kind of what this is here. And then again at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, we often think that gardens are only good for six or eight months a year. This is in February uh, and it's colorful, it's beautiful. There are obviously drifts there. This is a photograph by my former student, Nancy Ayton, University of Georgia master's uh, degree holder. And here we see broom sedge, uh, uh, little blue stem, the coppery color on the left. And then the silvery color is uh, sweet everlasting, or pearly everlasting. And look at the drifts. And the pearly ever everlasting <clears throat> demonstrates that as much as anything. Uh, the, the directional flow of that species. Now, here's a concept plan I did for a four acre native plant garden at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum. I designed this in 1997 when I was still working here, but <clears throat> the summer of 97, I spent a couple of weeks on site and in, in Madison uh, to develop the plans for it. And I'll just mention a couple of things here that you'll see in some some uh, scenes momentarily. Um, anyway, there is a circle here, kind of based on Janice Jensen again, a bit of a council ring with a terrace. And there are 11 different Southern Wisconsin plant communities represented. Here there's Mesic Prairie, and there's Dry Mesic Prairie, uh, and there's Dry Prairie <clears throat> at the top of the slope. And then there's uh, Oak Hickory Forest on the west facing slope here that grades into a maple basswood forest up here. And then we have a, over here we have a paper birch and red cedars, another common association in that, that part of the country. And this is about a football field length here, the Bigfoot, <laughs> uh, not really. Uh, but sitting here and looking this way, you have a great long view. And you'll see in a couple of slides that you don't see any of the lawn when you're sitting here when, these, when the tall grasses are at their uh, midsummer and late summer growth. You just see this sea of seemingly natural landscape when you're on the terrace. Uh, uh, and here's that view, the view from, from the, the circle <clears throat> in uh, July to August. And the trees on the right are burr oaks representing the burr oak savanna uh, that were planted as two inch trees in 2002. And here we see them in about 2020, 2019, photographed by Robert Yeager, Madison photographer, whose work is in the book that we've been talking about a little bit called Beauty of the Wild. Uh, but anyway, there, there are the certain areas of lawn that people can walk on and so forth. But yet the view that you get looks kind of like it's all wild. And that is the beauty of the wild. <laughs> Here it is in the fall, different, the same species, different time of year. Another view. Here there's a grove of paper, uh, uh, paper bark uh, birch, not gray birch like I used in the east. And then in the foreground, there's a semi-wet area. All the roof rainwater from one half of the building goes overland into this depression and is held there for a while until it evaporates. And again, at that garden, here's a, uh, an area, fantastic photograph. And I can't take any credit for the clouds, but they are great. <laughs> and maybe this is a good time to remember to remind ourselves of the four goals that landscape be ecologically sound, experientially rich, of the place, and, and dynamic with change over time. Oh, a little, another view. This is a vista view out toward Curtis Prairie, which is the oldest restored prairie in the world and has national landmark status now. But anyway, I created this little bit of an amphitheater as a place to view uh, the distant Curtis Prairie. 
And here's a, another council ring uh, inspired by Janice Jensen in another area which where we're really demonstrating the oak savanna character. Questions? <laughs> Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Question is basically how do you manage for change over time, right? Is that the essence of it? <laughs> yeah. Well, in a lot of cases, you let things do what they want to do, and you don't worry if if it changes. If if the it looks like a different garden than you started with, if the spaces maybe become a little smaller and the masses become a little larger, you don't worry terribly about that. Uh, then there's there is always the opportunity to burn or mow to keep woody things out of an area that you want to keep open. Uh, and so there is that, that possibility. Uh, so that it, <clears throat> but anyway, you, you play with it, you tamper with it, you, you tweak it, so to speak, over time. And the Wisconsin Garden, even during the years that I was in Georgia and then in New York, I would go back there every every summer basically to see family members and go to the Arboretum and do a walkthrough with the great gardener there, Susan Carpenter. And we would say, well, that needs to be pruned back or cut down. Uh, that needs to be burned and so forth. And so it's kind of a, uh, you, you decide over time what needs to be done, but you can't, it's hard to predict totally what would be done. Ideally, there would be a management plan, but again, I, I, I prefer to be on the site and, and make the recommendations. <laughs> mm -hmm. Others? What's the smallest amount of space you could do this in? The smallest amount of space you can do this sort of thing in? Good, very good question. Uh, I did a little native woodland garden in New York in 800 square feet. <laughs> uh, and it was just a little uh, sort of vi a vignette of a, of a northeastern woodland. And the trees we used were carpinus because they were historically in that area, but uh, were able to get a lot of plants in and, and feeling of that woodland in that amount of space. Now, currently in Madison, Wisconsin, I live in a condominium, second floor, and I have a, a terrace and I planted boxes of uh, cedar boxes. I have a total of about 40 square feet of, of planting area. And in it, I have little blue stem. And as I and Gary sit on the terrace in the evening, we watch the little blue stem blow backlit by the Western sun. So you get some of the character that reminds you of the place that inspired it. So it, it certainly is not a replication of the, the natural landscape but it has elements of the natural landscape and some of the good experiential qualities, I think. Uh, I do think you could do mini woodland gardens, M-I-N-I -I, woodland garden in an eighth of an acre. Uh, again, you don't have the whole forest, but you have representation uh, of the ground layer, particularly with some canopy cover. I haven't really, I don't have a formula by any means. Very good question. Other, do you, do you, does that help? <laughs> the invasive species certainly are a big problem. Maybe a bigger problem here than some places, but it's pretty bad in the Northeast as well. I've seen winged euonymus growing all through the forests in Connecticut, for example. And so there are lots of issues. Part of them is we should never introduce some of those plants, but we did, <laughs> and they're there. And uh, Certainly cutting is, you kind of got to cut them. <laughs> uh, and I, in terms of herbaceous things, there's a, a really uh, difficult one in the East called mugwort. And if you pull it, you leave little bits of roots in and you get 10 mugworts where you pulled out one. And so it's far better in my opinion to clip it at ground level. And mugwort is one which if it is cut back for a couple of growing seasons to the ground, it fades out fairly quickly. Woody things, it's really hard with buckthorn and privet and so many others. And I don't like using chemicals, but I don't object terribly to cutting a buckthorn and painting the stump because that's very localized, not being spread over, 
over a bigger area. Uh, um, but yeah, that's one of our biggest problems and we deal with it one way or another. <laughs> Yeah, interesting, good question. Uh, with climate change, uh, <clears throat> something that I really promote is diversity in our planting, because the more diversity we have, the more resilience we will have, because if something doesn't succeed as the climate changes, something else will. And I feel like it was really a good experience for me to spend time in the South and now I know plants which are common to northern forests, for example, but also occur in southern forests. So I feel comfortable planting those species in the north where it may soon be warmer than it has been, but it won't be warmer than it was in Georgia, so to speak. So diversity and, and then having plants that we know have a wide amplitude of, of, uh, of, of climate uh, that they can survive in a wide range of, of uh, geographic areas. Uh, but it certainly is real. It's something that we have to deal with. Where I really worry is in high elevations, like in North Carolina, the upper elevations, red spruce only is going to be crowded off the top of the mountain because it only grows above a certain elevation. Now the, it's getting warmer every year, every decade, and there's going to be no place for them to go. And so that type of environment is really in danger. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about the use of native plants for combating or maybe adapting to climate change? Or in this, I think he's actually referring to mitigating climate change um, with carbon sequestration and, and biomass. Yeah, well, certainly carbon sequestration is, is a, a good uh, service provided by plants. Uh, and something that is often forgotten is that grasses, for example, really do that as well as trees. Maybe better, the, the root mass of grasses is much greater and more carbon is sequestered in, in those deep uh, root systems. Uh, let's see. Yeah, a very good and very realistic question. Uh, people sometimes ask me, would you ever plant a non-native plant? I say, yes, I love tomatoes and basil. <laughs> but I, I, I don't think we should outlaw non-native plants, but I just want people to see the potential beauty of, of a real community of native plants. And I won't get upset if you have a corner of your garden that has camellias or something like that in it. Uh, and, and diversity, again, is, is a good thing. But again, I, just, I think people so often think that a naturally evolving landscape is not as beautiful. And I like to point out that it can be as beautiful as as uh, as an exotic collection. Yeah. Well, I, I will mention again back to my my terrace on the second floor. I have all native plants in wooden planters, but I have a bunch of ceramic pots that I inherited when I bought the apartment, and I I can put any plants from anywhere in the ceramic pots. But we have a policy in the wooden pl planters; those are all native, and you can create your own set of standards like that, but you can just decide that this area is native and maybe another area isn't. Okay. <laughs> I will, while we're on the subject, I will talk a little bit about nativars, cultivars of native species. And I'm not a fan of nativars. <laughs> and certain research now at Mount Cuba Center in, in uh, Delaware, Pennsylvania, they've been looking at the relative desirability among pollinators for cultivars of native species. And it's not uniform by any means, but a lot of times the cultivars are not as attractive to pollinators as the original native species that those pollinators lived with for centuries. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing how you have all these really colorful flowering plants. And <laughs> I never put two and two together, but there is a disparity between the, the 
Yeah. Yeah. I, my favorite, <clears throat> or my my big peeve is the orange flowered purple cone flower. <laughs> we don't need them. <laughs> Others, yeah. It would be, yeah. It, I always say that, but I have to say I haven't done many management plans at the time I've done a design. A lot of clients aren't willing to play, pay for a management plan. They're willing to play, pay for a planting plan. Uh, but certainly, and again, if one has the luxury of checking in with the property owner periodically, that's the best, I think, in guiding them. Uh, I do have to mention something else. <laughs> find it amusing. Years ago, I was teaching a landscape ecology class here. And I showed some work I had done in uh, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, and New York. And one student very appropriately said, and how do you know enough about all the plants in all those places to use them in design? Which is a very good question. And I said, well, I try to work with somebody who knows more than I do. In other words, local knowledge. And then the student said, then why do they hire you? <laughs> but I, I am a big believer in working with local experts, botanists, ecologists, in the area that you may be working, especially if you're not terribly familiar with it yourself. And I, I value those people's understanding of the local landscape. And we need to make use of that. <laughs> well, I think a good reference for each for restoration and management would be the Society for Ecological Restoration. And they have a good primer on ecological restoration that includes management. It's, it's right. a little bit more geared towards the, the restoration activity, but they, they do touch on Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Society of Ecological Restoration. Yes. Right. And they have a journal also called Ecological Restoration, right? That's right. <laughs> and, and Restoration and Ecology. Restoration yeah. Ecology, yeah. And they, they report on current research and activities in different biomes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But re really good observation. I, and the more we collaborate, again, from way back from Robertson Raymond's uh, book, American Plants for American Gardens, it was a result of the collaboration of a, an ecologist and a landscape architect. And certainly I have worked with ecologists almost everywhere I've worked, and we need to do more of that. Mm -hmm. Well, Good. <laughs> Martha, you get the last question. Switching gears, um, if you can return back to some of your, your four tenants at the very beginning of your talk, which really drew me in, but particularly the um, a, a sense of, of place or space or where you are, and that you kind of equate that as important as the other three, which are sort of a given. Um, and just speak a little more about that as opposed to just, okay, if I see a blue spruce, I better be in Colorado. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it goes back very much to looking for natural models in the region where you're working and letting that guide you in the design. And uh, if you do that, you won't be putting blue spruce <laughs> in Wisconsin or Georgia. Uh, but the whole idea, again, of looking to natural models, which is a great reason for field study among landscape architecture students. Once you've seen it in the field, it sticks. Uh, and it's also a, a plea for preserving natural models in the landscape because when, when they're gone, we don't have that reference uh, to work from. Uh, so looking for natural models in the region where you're working and matching those. Uh, again, back to the granite outcrop we were in this morning. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about applications of what we can learn about granite outcrops, maybe in an urban setting. And they become prime candidates a lot of times for rooftop planting, which is a very important aspect of, of our work now uh, because they, they take the heat and the sun and the wind, the shallow soil, the whole, the whole array of difficult <laughs> situations. And similarly, if you're in the, the shadow of a high-rise building on the north, north, northeast side of it, then maybe you look at a community, a, 
a natural ravine community in the region where you're working. And that gives you something to start from as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I better bring this formal session to a close uh, of the interest of time. And, uh, and uh, but I think in the process of shutting things down, there might be time for, you know, um, to linger a little bit and ask more questions um, on a, a more casual level. But let me just once again, thank you all and especially thank uh, Daryl for being here. Thank you. Thank you all.